to attract global tech investors for those of you who are still unbelievers. In the last five years, London has attracted more new international tech investment projects from the US than any other global city, including Singapore, Bangalore, Dublin, and Paris. UK tech companies have raised 12.4 billion pounds so far in 2022 alone, and that's more than the whole of 2020, though that's only second to the US of A. So join us this session to find out how the UK has achieved this phenomenal success uh, with our guest today. First up, we're going to have a two-way conversation. Our first guest is a recognized industry leader, a proven track record of over 20 years in various industries, including financial services, oil and gas, information technology and media, and serving established global and local organizations such as Deloitte, Kodak, Petronas and M Investment Bank. Previously, the co-founder and CEO of Futurize, an agency under the Ministry of Finance, mandated to drive the National Le Regulatory Sandbox, or the NRS. Uh, he was handpicked in 2020 to be part of the founding team of the National Economic Implementation and Strategic Coordination Agency, or LAKSANA, under the Ministry of Finance. His, uh, his particular profile stretches on and on, but to wrap things up, he has represented Malaysia at the Krasnoyarsk Economic Forum, the World Economic Forum branch of the Russian Federation, Smart City Expo World Congress in Barcelona, and Global Transformation Forum in 2017. Of course, the United Nations World Urban Forum in 2018 as well. He is an active participant in the Malaysian education system as well, in both university and secondary school programs. He's a volunteer for arts and STEM. He's a big man all around. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome technologist Mahdi Aziz, Chief Executive Officer of MDEC. He's on stage right now. Thank you, Ness. I'll, I'll pass the stage on to you. Let's, Let's have this conversation, conversation Mahdi. Let's, Let's go. go. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. So we have uh, today Lord Daisy in terms of, uh, uh, I think, again, a very distinguished member of uh, uh, the UK government before this. So I'll get right down to it at least we're here to listen to him to speak uh, to, to listen to him speak rather okay let's shoot with the first question that we have conversational uh, very much i think question about london being one of the the advanced digital tech hubs across the globe can i had a bit of an experience on that can you share a bit about the lessons that we can learn uh, in terms of um, what and how the government, when you were there, part of the government, uh, in terms of the positioning of London within the ecosystem, uh, digital and technology ecosystem, and where uh, countries like Malaysia and the rest of ASEAN can emulate, what kept you awake at night? So uh, it's a great honor to be here. I've uh, attended this uh, event virtually for the last uh, two years, but to physically be in Malaysia is a great joy. It's my first visit to Malaysia, so I'm very, very excited, but I can only spend um, 24 hours here, sadly. Uh, I had to, uh, I couldn't leave until Monday because I was entertaining a senior executive from Google who's coming over to talk about UK regulation, and I have to be back to lead a debate in the House of Lords on Thursday. So I'm hoping that Malaysian Airlines, which has a reputation for 100% punctuality, leaves on time to get me to my connection in Doha. But I don't want to leave Malaysia because this is a really vibrant and exciting place to be. And I don't want to sound trivial when I say just coming through the airport, you get a sense of the scale of ambition in Malaysia and indeed in Southeast Asia. And when I looked at uh, the questions and the, uh, so on in preparation for today's session, I thought that asking me to give you lessons uh, was probably not the right way of phrasing it because I think Malaysia, certainly in the last 25 years, has been on a huge journey as well on digital. And I would prefer to see it as an exchange of information and ideas. I think the UK and Malaysia, we can learn from each other. And one of the things I want to do through my work with the UK ASEAN Business Council is to strengthen the links between the UK and Malaysia. I think the first piece of, uh, I was gonna say lesson, and fall into my own trap, but the first uh, 
issue is ambition. And I know that sounds perhaps superficial uh, or easy to do, but actually just focusing on the tech sector, on digital, and making it very clear that you as a government care about the sector, want to support it, want to attract investment, is massively important. You know, when I was the trade envoy to Vietnam, and now in my role as the UK ASEAN Business Council Chairman, there are a lot of traditional companies who are enormously important, the Prudential, HSBC, and so on, but very little attention was paid by the British government to the tech companies in Vietnam or in Malaysia. So it's about ambition and focus. You're saying that we care about the tech industry and we want to, um, uh, we want to invest in them, we want to support them through skills, through regulation, through policy, but uh, above all, it's ambition. And so the first point I will make before your next question is that when we came into government in 2010, Downing Street became an open door for tech companies. You'd get these guys turning up in shorts and T-shirts uh, to meet the Prime Minister. We had people in Downing Street who were focused on tech. We had lots and lots of physical events where the tech community could come and exchange views with the policy makers and the politicians. And it just became an ongoing dialogue which constantly evolved the ecosystem for tech in the UK. Excellent uh, point that you raised there. So I'm just going to ask a bit more on the uh, meeting or the upcoming meeting with Google as well on regulations. Again, being part of the national regulatory sandbox that we did in Malaysia, that was our attempt to actually look at and bring in adaptive, adoptive regulations and creating new things. How important is that policy and based on uh, some regulatory changes that can create new policies or new directions in terms of doing that in terms uh, as, as far as creating and building uh, the startup ecosystem as well? So your points on that and your thoughts on that, um, I think UK is, was actually one of the countries that I looked at personally terms of developing something that we wanted to create here. So again, maybe you care to elaborate uh, on that? So my first point was about ambition, focus, and dialogue. My second point would be about uh, regulation, which is naturally flows from the first point. So we set up this organization, which was originally called Tech City, uh, but has become Tech Nation. It was set up as a sort of startup mentality. It had funding from government, but it was small, it was lean. Uh, it was uh, it adaptive and evolutionary, and that became the focus for uh, the tech community to talk to government. And one of the biggest, obviously, in my view, the one of the most important issues is regulation. So you need to have an environment where your policymakers and politicians are prepared to adapt the analog regulations for the physical world to the digital world. You know, I've driven around London in a car where the driver didn't have her hands on the steering wheel because we have regulations that allow self-driving cars to drive around London uh, as a test bed. As you correctly point out, uh, in financial services, our financial services regulator had what we call a sandbox. Uh, it's called a sandbox, just for those who may not get the cultural references, obviously for children when you put them in a sandbox to play, the idea is that young fintech companies that were doing different things in financial services could come to the financial regulator and play and say, this is what we want to do. This is where we bump up against regulation. Can you change the regulations or adapt the regulations to make it easier for us to do that? And we did, um, we brought in some very far reaching regulations about open banking, so the sharing of data between financial services companies help spawn an ecosystem. And I think as well, uh, Tech Nation, for example, came up with the idea of the entrepreneur visa. So again, uh, an immigration policy that would attract uh, tech entrepreneurs who wanted to base their companies in the UK, make it easier for them to come to the UK. So across the piece, whether it's transport or financial services, or in particular, things like healthcare, where regulation is a massive uh, issue in terms of patient privacy and so on. 
Uh, you have to lean in uh, as a government. You have to have this conversation, and then you have to be prepared to change regulations. Our system is not actually very well geared up for rapid change in regulation, uh, and you have to be flexible and creative. Uh, but in order to see innovation thrive, you have to ensure that companies can operate safely, uh, but not be hindered by uh, bureaucracy. Um, it was announced earlier this year at the London Tech Week itself uh, that uh, I think for at least for the first three months of this year, uh, UK is ranked second globally for the startup investment. So uh, after both the US and also uh, and ahead of both in India and also China for the first time. So as far as raising funds and setting up uh, operations in the UK itself, uh, I think UK has been been up there uh, in terms of uh, positioning, attractiveness, and things like that. Um, and this was the question that we had back in earlier, whether Brexit would have uh, a detrimental effect to the startup ecosystem in the UK. But that is not the case when we, we looked at it. How, how do you find, besides the regulations and policy, is there anything else part of the recipe for this success? as you can see it. So I was surprised to read how good the figures were for 2022, and maybe Brexit means that none of the tech entrepreneurs can now leave uh, the UK, so they're stuck and have to raise their money in the UK. But I think there are a number of factors here which are really interesting, which to a certain extent, government cannot legislate for. You know, Why has the UK, particularly after Brexit, got this uh, still incredible investment um, track record in startups? And the answer, I think, is this. You, uh, I was talking earlier to one of your colleagues about how Malaysia approached uh, digital strategy and um, uh, this multimedia corridor uh, uh, that goes through Kuala Lumpur started in the mid-90s. Uh, but your colleague said to me, you know, we wanted it to be the Silicon Valley of uh, Southeast Asia. And all of us uh, outside of the United States live with this incredible chip on our shoulder or insecurity that we don't have a Silicon Valley. And British politicians always used to say, we want a Silicon Valley in the UK. We do have Silicon Valley in the UK. We have Cambridge, Oxford, and London, this triangle of incredible science and innovation and uh, technology investment. And as you know, the whole point about Silicon Valley is it effectively is based on a world-class university, Stanford University, so it's that mix. But uh, I realized when I was the minister, actually what we didn't have that Silicon Valley did have was capital and experience. So what you need is you need the venture capital guys, many of whom, and women I should say, but guys is a catch-all term, uh, the venture capital people who not only may have start and run their own company, but also have a wall of capital that they can invest. And I think over time, the UK, it hasn't caught up with the US, but we, what we have now in the UK is, first of all, we have quite a few US venture capitalists now based uh, in London. But we have a far more experienced and seasoned venture capital uh, ecosystem which is able to raise money to invest. But also, we have a, now a whole ecosystem of founders, people who have built their companies, cashed out. They have not just the capital to invest, but also the experience to support those companies. And obviously, uh, as I said earlier, you know, there's a big wide world out there. So even though I think Brexit is a big blow to the UK economy, it has at least forced us to look harder at areas like Southeast Asia. And we also traditionally, of course, have a very close relationship uh, with the US sharing a language and to a, to a certain extent a culture. Uh, so there will still be opportunities for UK startups to uh, expand and grow globally. But I think the key to those amazing figures for 2022 is actually not a government intervention, as it were, it's a partnership, but an evolution of the growth of capital and experience in the UK. Yeah, sounds um, where, right where we are uh, in Malaysia right now, I think. As far as, um, again, the idea of having enough VCs or enough funds in the market in Malaysia is something that has become uh, the big elephant in the room that we have to address 
especially when looking down south, there's always Singapore where people can raise funds a lot easier in Malaysia. And then I, I will touch a bit on that. I think there are some efforts that are currently being done to be able to bring a bit more funds here and therefore making ourselves more attractive or at least complementary to what uh, Singapore does. But again, you mentioned a good point about founders having cashed out and now being able to be in that position, being angel investors or looking at investments as well. But again, the, the, the lines of uh, right now, and I'll touch a bit on trading. Um, Malaysia today is, uh, or rather UK today, is Malaysia's 18th largest trading partner. But a lot of this trading are very much non-digital goods and services, at least at this point. But the lines between what is non-digital and digital are rapidly uh, disappearing, if you may. Uh, do you see that there are quick wins for the kinds of investments now, whether it's the form of VCs or projects that the UK would be looking at in this market that we see oh, possibly that would be something more attractive that Malaysia or the region of ASEAN can actually offer to that investment community? So I think there's a real challenge in your question and a challenge for the UK government, which is, um, first of all, there's a big philosophical question which I was thinking about and which you've touched on in your question, which is, this is the Malaysian Digital Week, uh, Digital Economy Week. At what point in our lives will we stop talking about the digital economy and go back to talking about the economy? Because everything is now digital. You know, big, big British companies that have big uh, presence in countries like Malaysia, like British Aerospace. Obviously, British Aerospace is a manufacturing company, but it's more and more as well a digital company and should be part of uh, that debate. Uh, it's very hard, I think the, uh, and I think, so coming back to my point, I think the challenge for me or the challenge for the British government is we, te we, we can be lazy too. And uh, it's very easy for us to talk to HSBC or British Aerospace about the work that they're doing in Malaysia and the links that they have with Southeast Asia. It's much more difficult for us to talk to a healthcare company like TPP or whatever uh, about the work that they're doing in Malaysia, or, to, uh, or WPP, the advertising company. Now, advertising is now effectively a digital business. It's a data-driven business. We think of it as creativity and so on. Of course, that's important, but it's now a data business. So it's up to the British government to have the intelligence and foresight to say, what are the digital businesses in the UK that could really make a big uh, splash in Southeast Asia and in... Um, in Malaysia and the obvious areas where we have strengths where we should I think be more uh, proactive are cyber security uh, financial services fintech is an obvious strength uh, for uh, the UK and also to a certain extent the industries that I looked after film and television and video games uh, which again to all intents and purposes are digital uh, companies you know the whole create tech it's now called create tech phenomenon of creativity meeting technology, uh, the whole kind of thought of immersive experiences which are becoming much more um, mainstream are huge areas where I think the British can, to a certain extent, punch above their weight in terms of engagement uh, with a country like Malaysia. Okay. Two uh, good points and industries that we are, uh, at least we believe that we are very strong uh, in. Uh, one, very much on Createc, or, or digital creative content, uh, as we uh, call it over here. Uh, Malaysia traditionally has been quite strong in that and producing uh, animation and now expanding into games as well. Uh, strong enough that we are already exporting to Korea and also uh, Japan. Uh, so going back against the origins of anime and the likes. Um, we are looking at Web3 nowadays. So the new things like blockchain, the use of artificial intelligence, a bit more on AR, VR, and also extended reality. Um, these are the kinds of things that we believe, uh, some things that we can share, some things that we can learn and work on certain projects. So how we want to do it, at least the argument that we have in Malaysia today is that by introducing Malaysia, Malaysia Digital to succeed MSC was the fact that we want to have highly ambitious projects that we can at least catalyze the economy uh, through digital economy and digital uh, intervention, if you may, and looking at um, some of uh, the new things where we bring in 
more adoption and more projects that can create uh, different kind of jobs uh, that we see today. Um, your thoughts on that, or was that something that is outdated that has long done before, or um, would that be something of interest, again, like you said, for the UK companies to say that, oh, there's something happening in ASEAN, and Malaysia seems to be leading the way, and yep, that would create a bit more of a... Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's really important. Again, you know, I think events like this are, are really uh, important for the UK government and British companies to engage in. You know, we have a Department for International Trade that traditionally takes uh, companies around the world to visit. But I was very struck. Uh, well, first of all, the first person I bumped into when I got here was the head of the German Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> so I'm aware that, uh, you know, this is a competitive uh, arena. Um, but I was very struck when I went to Las Vegas uh, for the Consumer Electronics Show, and the guy who runs the Consumer Electronics Show said, you know, let me tell you what the French are doing here, and kind of took me around the French section of the exhibition, and it was kind of crazy, you know, the whole French government had just pumped tons of money into showcasing uh, French companies. And, you know, to a certain extent, the British government, I would never accuse a British company of being lazy, but the British government, you know, we trade on the fact that we are quite central geographically, you know, we can go west or east quite easily. We have the English language, and other countries do often have to work harder to raise their profile and their opportunities. Uh, but as I say, I think, I, I feel very strongly, partly because I'm hoping to take this new role with the UK ASEAN Business Council, that in terms of our engagement with Malaysia and Southeast Asia, we are still too traditional, relying they are important, massively important to our economy, too much on traditional businesses and not thinking creatively enough and understanding indeed what is happening here in Malaysia yeah. in terms of the digital economy. That's why it's so important for me personally to be here uh, in person and hear what you have to say and particularly, for example, about Malaysia's creative economy. And there are massive opportunities here and it is about uh, coincidence and chance encounters and conversations to say, actually, I know uh, a few people who I know would love to engage with you. And you can start by email or WhatsApp until you eventually um, have a visit. But unless you come here and find out really what is going on, your synapses don't make the connections that need to be made. Okay, excellent point. Looking forward to, to have you in your new role here in Malaysia. Let's talk a bit, at least one point on the quality of life and we spoke about the employment visa, that uh, an entrepreneur uh, visa that the UK has. Uh, so over in Malaysia, we do have, um, um, uh, I think, uh, different types of that. Uh, there's entrepreneurship uh, permit that runs from one to five years in Malaysia called MDEP, offered by, through MDEC. Uh, we do have the foreign knowledge workers that basically is renewable every year or every two years, depending on your company. So that allows uh, the injection of, of foreign skills as well. And recently, we launched what we call uh, Birantau, essentially a translation of digital nomad. So again, I think a lot of the countries, whether it's in Europe and especially in the uh, exotic locations and countries in ASEAN are basically rushing towards trying to grab this new uh, brand of digital workers or digital nomads. Um, again, how do you see, uh, besides the long history that Malaysia and the UK would have, uh, in terms of locations and contributions to what we can do, um, where the Chamber of Commerce or even members of the Chamber of Commerce can play a bit more role in ensuring the local nomads or the localized nomads are here and being able to stay on and enjoy the quality of life here? What's, what's attractive in Malaysia? I think uh, that would be the long question. Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, London is an obvious place where people like to live. So your focus on quality of life is really important. You know, people base themselves, they don't just, a few people do, but they don't just follow the best tax rate uh, or whatever. Uh, they want to be in a city that has a thriving culture and uh, is exciting and interesting to be in, particularly as, uh, to a certain extent, tech skews towards uh, the younger age group. And I always take great pleasure in meeting people who have come to live in London who say that, you know, London is now their home and they would never 
leave, even if they've come from a different country. But on the flight over here, you know, there was an English guy in the next door seat telling the uh, steward how excited he was to be returning to Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it was the first time since COVID. And of course, he talked about, you know, seeing his friends and eating great food. And those are important, really important. And um, so to have a thriving cultural scene is, is I think, a fantastically important. You know, 75% of uh, people living in this region live in cities. And uh, it's really important to focus on culture. And South Korea is another example where they've put kind of culture first. And I was the culture minister in the UK as well as the tech minister. And people could never work out you know, that, well, that's really weird. You're doing culture on the one hand, museums and, uh, you know, performing arts. And on the other hand, you're doing tech, you know, Facebook and Google. But actually, they are inextricably uh, linked. And I always, again, it's not related to Malaysia, but I always remember uh, sitting next to the Indonesian minister for the creative industries and discovering that she was responsible for food. And as you can tell just by looking at me, food is a big, big hobby of mine. And I constantly lobbied the Prime Minister to make me responsible for high-end restaurants in London as a vital part of the creative economy. But it's, I'm only being slightly facetious. It is, they're inextricably linked, so you're quite right to focus on it. And I think that, you know, it sounds an odd thing to say that policymakers should be thinking, when you come and live in Kuala Lumpur or Malaysia, you know, what is it going to be like for you? How can we make your life as easy as possible? And if you build it, they will come. Yep, interesting point, the mystery of high-end restaurants. But uh, I think uh, uh, we should have more conversations along those lines, uh, definitely uh, offline. Uh, we are close to running out of time, so I, I would have to actually just summarise and have that uh, offline, as I mentioned. I think uh, a good uh, thank you for the good input and also feedback in terms of what we have here. If there's anything that I can say, and I'm being critical a bit of the Malaysian community, is that we do sell, sometimes we do sell ourselves a bit short. We have tons of things, whether it's culture, whether it's obviously food, and, and the digital ecosystem that we already have here. So again, uh, there's a lot to be shared, like you said, lessons that we can learn from there, and also exchange of ideas and uh, new things, that um, how we approach certain developments of the industry, the ecosystem, and the economy as a whole. So again, thank you very much, Lord Daisy, uh, for your uh, excellent input. Uh, we look forward to have more. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Walaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mahathir Aziz, CEO of MDEC, and of course, uh, speaking to our esteemed guest, Lord Ed Daisy, of former UK Government Culture and Digital Minister, and I think and I really do hope there will be a new ministry called the Ministry of Food in the House of Lords. Lots of nice debates to be had over there. But uh, from their conversation,